Thanks for listening. If you'd like to schedule a one-on-one -on -one coaching with Dr. Lodi, please visit drsudliff.com. I am an American board certified OBGYN, a mom, a Muslim, and I'm talking about sex. This is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Welcome to the Muslim Sex Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Sada Flody, and this episode is everything you need to know about chronic illness and how that affects the intimacy. But before I get into it, there are a few things that I want to make very clear. One of them is that I am not giving any type of medical advice. So if you're having any medical issues, please speak with your primary care provider. And if you have any questions about your religion, please speak with your friendly neighborhood religious leader. And this is the Muslim Sex Podcast because I just happen to be a Muslim woman that talks about sex. And so in this episode, I am super excited to invite and to have on with me Dr. Brittany Panico. And um, so Dr. Panico, if you don't mind, if you could please um, introduce yourself to the listeners and to the viewers uh, of the show. Yes. Hello. Thank you for having me. So I am Dr. Brittany Panico. I'm a board certified rheumatologist. I treat adult patients with autoimmune conditions and osteoporosis and gout. I have a practice in Gilbert, Arizona. That's a um, suburb of the Phoenix area called Summit Rheumatology. And I'm really excited to talk a little bit more about how having a chronic condition or an autoimmune condition can relate to things like intimacy and just some topics that we might not explore necessarily in an office visit. And um, so I think this is a wonderful bridge to be able to have that conversation. So thanks for having me. Yes, thank you so much for coming on. So I'm really excited to get into the topic today. So as we know, you know, there's so many different types of intimacy aside from just physical intimacy. There's emotional, there's experiential, there's so many other ways that uh, people look to connect with their spouse and their partner. And I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about rheumatologic diseases and the diseases that you see and that you treat and how that impacts a person's relationship. Absolutely. So the thing that comes to mind first and foremost, when we talk about having an autoimmune condition is that patients, and this primarily affects women, although I have plenty of male patients as well, but traditionally my type of autoimmune conditions um, affect women more so than men. So things that patients may start to experience or identify is that they have more pain or stiffness. So um, fatigue is a big portion of that feeling that people can have. And I think when our body starts to change, like for example, when we have an illness or a virus, a cold, right? There, there are certain internal signals that tell us we may not necessarily want to be touched or talked to in, you know, a certain type of way, or we may just want to sort of be kind of alone or, you know, sleep more, things like that. Um, and so with a chronic condition or leading into a diagnosis of establishing that, sometimes patients may just not feel like themselves. They may identify that something is off or feels different, but not necessarily have words to describe it particularly. So body language is a very big component of things, right? If you're experiencing pain or discomfort with touch, even light touch, um, that can be a factor. If you're more tired, right? If you just don't feel like you have the physical energy to stay awake or do all of the things that your day, you know, is asking of you. Um, and then communication is challenging, right? If we don't necessarily feel good in our own body, it may be hard to outwardly communicate that. Um, so those are some things that kind of come on in the beginning, right? As we're sort of establishing that you know, you may see a rheumatologist. And then once you have a diagnosis, once you kind of start that process, it may be hard to factor that into your identity, right? How does somebody go from being a normal, quote unquote, feeling good person to then, you know, possibly weeks or months later have a diagnosis like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or 
let's say psoriasis, psoriatic arthritis, right? Those are things that you can see in people. Mm. Um, so I think reframing that image of what you, who you are is really challenging um, and can play into, you know, intimacy and again, communication with our partners. Right. Absolutely. You know, when you just mentioned um, psoriasis and other illnesses where you can actually see those physically, right? Sometimes we have patients will have a chronic illness that we can't necessarily see, but those that are more visible uh, on the body, then I would assume that that probably plays a lot into body image and how we and the patient see themselves. Absolutely. I've, I've had patients who have psoriasis kind of, you know, in the non sun exposed areas, men can have psoriasis in the genital region. I mean, women can too, but that can be very painful. So to have, you know, an, an intimate relationship with a partner can be challenging because it may be physically uncomfortable. I think that plays a role, you know, as, also with patients who have Sjogren's. So women who have a diagnosis of Sjogren's may have a lot of vaginal dryness or sort of not necessarily be able to, you know, have the experience um, in a sexual way that they once had. And so that can play a big role as well um, of learning what your body signals are meaning. You know, it may not be, again, we talked about outwardly visible, but this is more internal mm. and you know, again, having that experience of like, okay, this, this intimacy feels different now. Um, and, you know, kind of not to get too far into the conversation, but the role that medication plays in how we feel is a big factor as well. Right, right. You know, I'm just wondering, um, usually how old are the patients that come to you? I said, I know that sometimes they are you know, we talk about like a bimodal distribution or like, you know, sometimes some disease states will start out when people are in their um, adolescent years and or will start off, you know, maybe when they're in their 50s and 60s or some will start, you know, off when in their reproductive years. So I guess it varies with each disease condition, correct? What, it do does. It does. And I think the lines are becoming less defined with sort of the after effects of COVID. Mm. Um, and so really I treat adults 18 and older. And so things like rheumatoid arthritis, I'm seeing patients, you know, of all ages with a new diagnosis, psoriatic arthritis doesn't necessarily have an age sort of identity mm. to it. Um, things like lupus and Sjogren's or what we call the connective tissue conditions, those tend to happen more in the reproductive years. So younger patients are, are um, experiencing that. But again, we're seeing manifestations of these things even, even later than we kind of thought that they would be um, after the effects of COVID. So it's not as easy to say as it once, you know, it once kind of was. Um, but I would say, you know, again, people of, of all ages are, are experiencing these things. And then there's also other things as, as women tend to age or men as well. So there's a condition called polymyalgia rheumatica where mm -hmm. after the age of 50, you can experience this sudden onset of very intense stiffness and pain. And so for very active older adults, that can be very debilitating to them. Um, and then osteoporosis, although we don't necessarily classify that as an autoimmune condition, as we start to get into the later, you know, postmenopausal years, 65 and older, if you have very brittle bones and have experienced a fracture, for example, you know, those things are going to be more top of mind. Um, but things as far as, um, you know, the stuff we mentioned earlier, tend to be younger people, but not always. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I think you mentioned a little bit about this, and I'd like to get into it a little bit more as um, different medications that you use for a chronic illness, right? So I know that, you know, for people that um, say have seizures, you know, some anti epileptic drugs will affect their libido will affect, um, you know, how they feel. And also, we know, like with birth control, that can affect the libido as well. We know that calcium channel blockers used for high blood pressure can affect uh, 
uh, libido and arousal. We also know that you know anti-anxiety and antidepressants can also affect uh, definitely libido. For example, Zoloft and Prozac and things like that. So. Are there medications that you use for chronic conditions um, that you treat that you've noticed have also affected, say, desire or libido or anything like that? Absolutely. And this is something that I am trying to be more aware of with my patients because I had a young woman bring this to my attention and I hadn't really been giving it much thought before. Um, I'm sorry to say that, you know, sometimes we tend to prescribe medications, we talk about the risks and benefits. And the sexual function or libido is, as a rheumatologist, that's not always something that I'm thinking yes. of, right? So um, I'm trying to be much more aware of that and discuss that with my patients. And one of the biggest things, or I guess two of our main um, medications are NSAIDs or the anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen, Advil, Aleve, even the prescription ones like Celebrex. So in both males and females, NSAIDs can change libido or change actual sexual function. So I had a patient, um, this is the young woman that brought it to my attention. She was on something called meloxicam and asked me, you know, does this affect orgasm? And I looked it up. And of course, you know, that is something on the list of side effects is that NSAIDs can decrease your ability to have an orgasm. So mm -hmm. having that discussion with her really opened my eyes to, you know, something that I hand out very frequently, something that I recommend over the counter even that's available to anyone can really change the way that we feel sexually. And whether or not that then translates into libido, right? If you're not experiencing things the same way, then your desire is going to change. Absolutely. Um, so mm -hmm. that was a big impact. And then steroids. So prednisone is probably one of my most common medications that I prescribe, at least in the beginning of a diagnosis. And that can make patients feel both depressed or anxious, or for men, it can really bring on um, feelings or symptoms of anger and aggressive moods. So all of those are going to play a role into, you know, your intimacy with partners, with establishing new relationships, right? If you're trying to date and identify yourself and you're on one of these medications, it, it may make you feel a certain way that you don't necessarily feel like you have control over. Um, and so other things when we think about fatigue and sort of how we feel when we take medications, um, things like methotrexate can impact that. And that's something that I try to be cognizant of as well you know, on the days that you take the, that medication, because it's only taken once a week, yeah. you might not necessarily feel very good or want to sleep more or just feel sick to your stomach. And so if you're, you know, if, if your routine is that you tend to be more intimate on the weekends and you take your medication on a Thursday or Friday, that may interrupt that routine, right? So we have to kind of think about all of these things when we counsel our patients on how to take medication as not only how is it going to affect the way that you feel, right? We hope that these treatments make you feel better. But mm -hmm. if they don't, then what is that impact? The other side of things, too, is that if they make you feel very good, right? If you start to feel euphoric or you start to feel invincible, that can lead to risky behavior as well. So I think we have to just be aware of, you know, okay, what are these things how are they affecting us and our brain chemistry, right? And how is that playing a role into our sexual health? Absolutely. You know, you mentioned um, just taking into account, you know, what's going on in a person's life. And I think that's really important. We talk about that when we talk about the female sexual response. And, you know, a lot of times I'll have patients come and ask me about decreased libido, decreased uh, arousal or desire. And we take into account what we call the biopsychosocial model. And, you know, that is like their biological things that may be going on with them um, in terms of perhaps like anatomy and things like that. And like a chronic condition like this, what you're speaking of, but but also, um, you know, the psycho and the social part of it go, the social includes the medications, 
Right. And so that's why it's so important to know what type of medications patients are on and the side effects um, that can come as a result of those medications. You know, you mentioned, which I thought was really interesting about NSAIDs or anti-inflammatory medication that um, can sometimes impact orgasm. And I find that interesting because actually I just went to a conference um, with the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health, ISHWISH, and they talked about how in uh, our brains, in the neural pathway for pain and orgasm is actually the same up to a point, and then it diverges a little bit. And they talked about how a patient had, um, a, a, you know, in a certain part of their brain, um, they had, it was severed. And so then, um, or rather it was impacted. And so they weren't able, they no longer felt pain, but at the same time, they were no longer able to orgasm. So I'm finding that interesting that, um, you know, that your patient that was on an NSAID, that was on an anti-inflammatory, that was dulling perhaps the pain that she had was also impacting her ability to orgasm. So very interesting. I didn't even know that. So that's- That is very interesting. And I, I didn't necessarily make the connection that those pathways were related, but that makes complete sense. Um, you know, we kind of think about that with patients who have spinal cord injuries or disorders, right? If you're paralyzed per se from the waist down, you know, what is your sexual function going to be like? So, um, you know, those pathways definitely converge together. And, and I think we just have to be more aware that the existence is there and have those discussions and, and really create that safe space, right? Like as Absolutely. physicians, mm -hmm. our job is to have, you know, however long the patient's in the room, this is a completely confidential and safe place to ask questions mm -hmm. and in a non-judgmental way. And I think that that's really, you know, as more, I would say, if not more important now because of how just society and our, you know, everything in front of us, social media, everything is portraying the best in everyone. But the reality is the opposite, right? Like we, we all have our struggles and the things that we, we want to have answers to. And I would rather look something up in front of a patient and be able to interpret what they're seeing than have them go home and, and read misinformation or something that's incorrect and have that myth, right, really lead their, their way of thinking. So um, I definitely have explored side effects or other things in front of patients with them because we can have that conversation together. Um, so, you know, exactly what you're saying about those pathways, you know, if, if that's a, a, a something that you've noticed as a patient, right, when I do this, then this also happens, let's figure that out together instead of just dismissing our patients, nope, that's not a thing, right, let's figure yeah. that out. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, the, what, what you talk about, it reminds me a lot of just basically shared decision making and understanding all the risks and benefits to anything, whether it be a drug or, you know, modification of a lifestyle or whatever it is that you're doing, you know, and really discuss that with your um, provider. I think that's so important. So, you know, I, I also saw on your bio that you do a lot with anti inflammatory diet. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yes. So as a rheumatologist, I have sort of entered this space where we've, you know, this, the, the science is there. It's been there for a long time, but really recognizing what our gut bacteria is doing to the rest of our body and how that's working for us. And inflammation really starts with the food that we eat and then how our body takes care of those chemicals or processes those nutrients. And so there has been a very big link between eating essentially whole foods. So foods that you recognize, right? They come out of the ground that way. They're grown that way. You have an object that you recognize as a food rather than a packaged or processed or man-made thing. And, you know, really consuming a diet rich in those foods and how that plays a role in how we heal and our brain function, our neurotransmitters, the way that our body is able to recover from things. The whole, you know, eat chicken soup when you don't feel good. It's not just an old wives tale. It, it's a thing, right? There's a lot of nutrients in, in broth and vegetables and, and those things are, are good sources of nutrients to help your body heal. 
So I'm trying to focus on helping my patients recognize that I know it's easy to just grab something off the shelf that's packaged, but what is that actually doing to your body and how is that working against you and your condition rather than using food as nutrition to nourish our bodies and help us heal. So I have a weekly Facebook um, video series where I feature a recipe that is sort of, uh, um, the premise is that it's an anti-inflammatory recipe. So again, whole foods, real nutritious um, ingredients, and then talking about how I modify that recipe based on what you may have available in your kitchen or your pantry. And as a busy mom, how I'm able to incorporate those things into my weekly routine um, with meal rotation, just to make it accessible to everyone. Um, we think that healthy eating is expensive and is time consuming, and it does not have to be. And so I just want to really promote you know, get us thinking about nutritious food and getting us wanting to eat those foods rather than reach for the sugary, you know, carbohydrate processed things that we're all, you know, we're all addicted to. And there's a chemical reason that we're addicted to it. And so um, I just think it's really important that we start talking about this because not a lot of people are, but it does make a big impact. And um, one of the foundations, if, if you're interested in kind of exploring this, um, really starts with the blue zone culture or communities where people tend to, um, these communities have the highest percentage of centenarians, so people who live to be 100 or close to 100. And mm -hmm. what is it about their diet that allows them to live so long? Um, so that's kind of where this research comes from. And then also, again, the scientific study of our gut bacteria um, so it's just a really exciting, you know, we, we say it's new, it's really integrative. It's been around forever, but we're just bringing more attention to it. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping that it'll catch on. The more we talk about it, the more people will recognize like, yes, if I eat a bowl of ice cream, I might feel bloated and feel sluggish. And if I eat, you know, a bowl of fruit and cottage cheese, I might feel energized and feel, you know, lighter. So identifying those things in our diet. Mm -hmm. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, and I know that so much of um, anti inflammatory diets do affect uh, the rheumatologic diseases, right? The autoimmune diseases and things like that. I guess it's your body reacting to what it is that we're putting inside our bodies and seeing it as foreign and then causing that disease to. Yes, it's definitely a component for sure. Yeah, yeah, well, that's fantastic. I'm glad you focus on that. Um, and then, you know, I, I'm wondering if you talk to your patients also about, you know, we talked a little bit about um, self image and those, you know, body image and things like that, but is there a way that you approach it with your patients and, um, and our clients when they have uh, issues with their body image? Absolutely. So it is something that I try to discuss with people because it does make a big in impact right on their life. And I think just having the patient feel comfortable enough to ask, you know, I, I don't do a full skin exam. I'm not a dermatologist. So if there is something again, like psoriasis, let's say visible in a more sensitive area, I, I need the patient to let me know that. Um, and I'm also trying to be more mindful about asking. And I think part of it is really getting down to what it is that's bothering the individual. So I have patients who have, you know, early signs of osteoarthritis. So degenerative arthritis that shows up as sort of bulging knuckles, for example. And some people are very bothered by the way that looks and the way that it feels, right? Your grip can be altered. It's, you may feel weak, you know, hand weakness, things like that. It may be painful. And so if that's top of mind for a patient, we can address what that means. We can talk about ways to help realize that, you know, is it dangerous? Is it uncomfortable? How do we sort of blend that in with their lifestyle goals. Same with, you know, rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, right? If you see that there's something swollen or you see a rash in a place that, you know, let's say your face, for example, how can we help with that to diminish the 
sort of vulnerability or the impact that it has on that person. Um, I notice that body image comes up a lot again, you know, relating things back to steroids, prednisone. Um, people tend to gain weight if they're not necessarily cognizant about how much they're consuming. Prednisone can make you feel more hungry. So a lot of people come back and say, you know, I'm very upset about the amount of weight that I've gained. And so we have to have that conversation. I've started counseling patients in the beginning when I prescribe it, you know, if this is a concern of yours, you have to be in control of what you put in your mouth. The medicine is going to make you feel a certain way, possibly, but you have to establish that boundary within yourself to prevent massive, you know, prevent weight gain. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one way that I tend to talk to patients is just letting you know that there, this risk is there. And another thing too, it, it, as you know, arthritis and weight impact each other. I think a lot of people come to my office and say, you know, I've been told by this other doctor that I just need to lose weight. And part of it is impacted based on weight, the way that our body feels when we're heavier versus when we're at an ideal body weight. But part of it is what that message means to us, how we take that information and internalize that. And what do we make that mean? So I counsel patients, you know, yes, you may be a little bit overweight or you may be a little bit away from your ideal, what you feel is your best weight for your body. But how can we use that to your advantage? How can we, you know, still allow you to feel good about yourself by having goals to either change that or live with this new self? And it's not just about losing weight. I think we live in a culture, a society right now where weight loss is a very heavy presence. Everybody, you know, is pressured to lose weight, but not everyone is meant to be skinny. Not everyone is meant to be, you know, super thin. And what do we make that mean as, as unique individuals? And so having that conversation that, you know, this phase in your life, it might be okay to be a little bit heavier, but we're going to work towards getting you to feel good because once your body feels good, you may have the energy or the internal motivation to start exercising or to start really being mindful about what you eat. So again, that anti-inflammatory diet comes into place with weight loss too. These are helpful tools to help people eat less carbohydrates, less refined sugar, less processed foods, which then inevitably will help them lose weight. So I think the conversation is, it's very cyclical. It's let's get you feeling good so that you have the ability to address these things. And then just be mindful internally of what is the language that we're, what language are we using inside the office that patients then take internally as, you know, something about their body image? You know, I think what you mentioned um, is really important, right? Is you know, the language that we use when we talk to patients, but also what is the language that the patient is using to talk to themselves, mm -hmm. right? What, what is it? How is it that they see themselves? What are the thoughts that are going through their head, right? So now they have this new diagnosis of whether it is, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, or if it's a Sojourn's disease, or if it's, you know, lupus, you know, what are they telling themselves? Are they telling themselves that they're they're broken, they're, you know, they're not able to function in society as other people are, or, you know, what are the things that they're telling themselves? And then once they start telling themselves negative thoughts, right, once they start speaking to themselves negatively, then they're going to feel negatively toward themselves. Absolutely. And then the actions or the way that they come out or the way that they present themselves to others is also going to be very negative. So I think that, you know, exactly what you talk about is, you know, listening to the language that's used not only in the office, but also, you know, asking the patient how they feel about themselves and what are the thoughts that they have and then how we can change or help them to change that narrative so that they speak more kindly and more compassionately to themselves 
so that they show up differently. Mm -hmm. And so that they, and kind of like what you were saying, right, is when they start to feel better, then they'll approach their relationship with not only themselves, but with others with more positivity so that, you know, they can have that intimate relationship or that emotional intimacy that they may desire with their partner or that physical intimacy. And like you said, once they feel better, once their condition is more under control, then they'll start to feel better and then they'll want that relationship. Absolutely. Um, to connect. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, absolutely. Um, so what are some key takeaways that you think patients should know about in terms of, say, their chronic condition or, you know, when seeking out to help with their physician? What, what are key things that they should ask? So one of my platforms or something that I speak a lot of get about, you kind of mentioned is that shared decision-making is really, we are not mind readers. And as a patient, having the courage or just the, the, you know, feeling comfortable to be able to ask questions about intimacy, I think is very important. You know, we, we sort of expect to kind of come in and for the physician or provider to be on their computer and hustling through the visit. And I think really trying to, you know, lead the conversation of these are, these are my concerns and these are ways that, that I either am not happy with how I feel or things that I want to try to improve on. I really try to coach my patients on, you know, what are the things that are going well? What are the things that you want to change? And we, we've kind of gotten a, away from this, you know, bringing a list to your doctor's visit. But I think that's still very important. And I don't want patients to be afraid to have concerns or to have topics that they want to bring up. Um, and I think that, you know, just, just being the type of patient that wants to be involved in your care, right? We can prescribe medication. We can talk to you about lifestyle changes, but that only works if you're involved with those decisions as well. And that's that whole share decision-making component, right? We have the educational tools to help you identify solutions, but as the patient or the client, you have to make sense of what that information is and put that into practice in your life. So if you're not getting the answers that you want from your visit, how else can you seek out those answers? And the internet is not always the best way. Yeah. So my takeaway, I would say, is just, you know, really practice asking those questions. And it may take a couple of visits. It may take developing that relationship with your provider to be at a place where you can have those conversations, right? If my patient hadn't asked me about her medication and her sexual function, who knows if anyone would have brought that up? Right. I, I have no idea, right? I'm, I wasn't bringing it up on my own to my patients. So now I'm more cognizant about that. I've changed the way I approach talking about medications because of that one particular patient. So as patients, we can't be afraid that we're being judged or that we're going to be you know, critiqued about our questions. Every question is important because it's a, it's a sign that we need to offer more help or advice. And if you've gotten shut down or dismissed about a concern, ask someone else about it, right? Your next visit with your primary doctor or your OBGYN or your specialist, ask them the same question and see what they have to offer. Um, because we all have slightly different opinions and different ways of approaching, you know, sensitive topics. So um, I think, you know, like like what you're doing and having this podcast really empowers people to have these conversations, right? Like we kind of shy away from things that we don't necessarily feel comfortable talking about, but yeah. we want our patients to feel comfortable. So you know, in order for us to be better doctors, we need patients to ask us those tough questions. So um, I just really encourage people to, you know, feel empowered, feel in control over your health care. And if you're not getting the information or the help that you feel like you need, get a second opinion. I'm a big advocate of, you know, getting another opinion because it never hurts. It never hurts to hear someone else's um, perspective. So, um, Again, you know, my my number one takeaway is that you are in charge of your own health and 
just practice, you know, having these conversations and sometimes like role playing, you know, we kind of giggle that, you know, asking questions or role playing um, is taboo. But as, as a mom, I do this with my kids, right? I role play how to get them to ask questions. And, you know, if we have a partner or somebody that we feel we can confide in, practice with them. So that way, when you are in the office, you, you feel comfortable asking those questions. Yeah, that's a great idea is uh, role playing. I think that's fantastic. And, you know, kind of what you talked about before, I think that as physicians, we often forget that sexual health is health. And we don't ask, we don't ask our patients. And mm -hmm. I think it, a lot of it has to do with, you know, our own discomfort. And that even in society, it's still taboo to talk about it. And also, I feel that a lot of times physicians, you know, I don't know about your residency program and, you know, but I know that all I can say is that my residency program and being a gynecologist, I wasn't even trained in sexual health. And we didn't talk about it. We didn't have any modules on it or anything like that. It was just kind of like, you know, you just kind of figure it out. You learn as you go, whatever, right? Like nobody. And you're the female reproductive that. doctors, I know, right? I know, I know. And, and even in medical school, I don't know about your medical school, but like my medical school, we, we had like, I don't know, maybe a couple of hours. That was it in like yeah. four years. So like not much. So we really mm -hmm. don't get much training in it. And so for me, it was important as a gynecologist to go and get more training. And so I actually completed a certificate course through the University of Michigan um, on sexual counseling and education to get, and it's a year long program, and to get that additional information and education on sexual health, because mm -hmm. really, we just, we don't have the information. But, yeah. but you know, it's so important for our patients to ask us and to feel comfortable and to have that relationship. And it's, I think it's hard, you know, during an office visit when you're rushing and you've only got like 10, 15 minutes in between patients, but, you know, perhaps you then schedule another appointment with that patient just to discuss those sexual side effects or their sexual concerns that they may have regarding their decision or diagnosis that they have now and how that's going to impact their life. So I definitely- Absolutely would ask patients to, you know, advocate for themselves and to reach out to physicians that uh, will be more compassionate and sympathetic toward your concerns regarding your sexual health. Yes. So yes. how can um, somebody that's listening to this podcast reach out to you and get in touch with you if they wanted to schedule a consultation or just come and see you, you know, and I think it's fantastic that you deal a lot with diet because we know that diet impacts a huge part and it plays a huge part in um, disease. So how can they get in touch with you? Absolutely. So my social media platform is AZ. So Arizona AZ room, R H E U M doc D O C um, on Instagram and YouTube. And then Facebook is Dr. Brittany Panico P A N I C O. And then my practice information is summit rheumatology um, in Arizona. So I can be found there and then on LinkedIn as well. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Panico. It was such a pleasure to have you on and I really appreciate the work that you're doing and uh, the health that you are bringing back to your patients, so. Thank you, thank you for having me. Yes, thank you. So, well, we are done here and it's been real and really intimate. And remember, this is not meant to be any type of medical advice. So if you are having any issues, please seek out your healthcare provider and go and reach out to them and ask them for their help because they are there to help you out. And until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Please be so kind to leave a review for the Muslim Sex Podcast. Five stars are always welcome and I would greatly appreciate it. And until next time, this is the Muslim Sex Podcast. Thank you.